In this video, we're going to continue working with polyprotic acids and introduce polyprotic bases. And a way I would encourage you to think about polyprotic acids, or bases for that matter, is as just multiple copies of a monoprotic acid or base. In the last video, we saw that the PKAs or PKBs for a polyprotic acid or base are pretty far separated. This means that we can basically think of, for example, a diprotic acid as two monoprotic acids with two distinct pKa values operating more or less independently of each other. We'll see how that works, for example, in this practice problem. So we've got carbonated water, which contains a palatable amount of dissolved carbon dioxide. The CO2 reacts with water to produce carbonic acid. And we want to know what are the, the equilibrium concentrations of H3O plus, HCO3 minus, or bicarbonate, and CO3 2 minus, or carbonate anion, in a saturated solution of CO2 in water with an initial carbonic acid concentration of 0.033 moles per liter. And we're given Ka1 and Ka2 for carbonic acid, which is a diprotic acid. So first, the first thing we want to do is get a handle on the chemical reactions that are occurring when carbonic acid is dissolved in water. This is the key acidic species. And it's got two removable protons, and so two acid ionization or acid dissociation equilibria to reactions with water. H2CO3 can react with water to produce bicarbonate and hydronium ion, and that's got this K1 value of 4.3 times 10 to the negative 7. And then HCO3 minus bicarbonate can react with water to produce CO3 2 minus and H3O plus. And as we're familiar with from the last video, we can see here that Ka2 is much, much smaller than Ka1, bicarbonate is a much, much weaker acid than the neutral carbonic acid. To find the equilibrium hydronium ion concentration, we're going to start with that reaction that has the larger Ka value. That's really going to drive the production of H3O+. We can think about that in terms of an ice table and an equilibrium-based approach here and say, all right, my initial H2CO3 is 0.033 moles per liter. And that's going to go away to some extent and produce H3O plus and HCO3 minus. We're going to call that concentration of those species produced X. And so in the numerator of the reaction quotient, we have X times X at equilibrium. And in the denominator, we would have that 0 0.033 initial molarity minus X. But we can assume X is small here because of the small Ka1 value, very, very tiny with respect to 0.033. So we can say that the denominator at equilibrium will essentially be equal to 0.033. Now x becomes our only unknown since we have a value for Ka1. We can solve for x, and this is equal to the equilibrium hydronium concentration. It comes out to 1.2 times 10 to the negative 4 moles per liter, and I encourage you to pause the video and verify this on your own. The other thing we can see here is that because all of the bicarbonate, HCO3 minus, came from acid dissociation of H2CO3, and it's in a one-to-one -one mole ratio with H3O plus, the molarity of bicarbonate is equal to the molarity of hydronium, also 1.2 times 10 to the negative 4 moles per liter. So how do we find the concentration of carbonate from here? Well, now we need to think of bicarbonate acting as an acid and surrendering a proton to water to produce carbonate and hydronium ion, the second acid ionization equilibrium of carbonic acid. And here, we can write an equilibrium equa uh, equation for this reaction. Ka2 is equal to carbonate concentration times hydronium concentration divided by the bicarbonate concentration. And actually, we already know three of the four variables in this equation. We know Ka2 that was given, we know the hydronium concentration, and we know the bicarbonate concentration. And so realizing that these two concentrations are known and we know they're equal to each other, the hydronium and bicarbonate concentrations are going to divide out, and we're going to arrive at a final result showing that the equilibrium carbonate concentration is actually simply equal to Ka2 here. So equilibrium concentration of CO32 minus is equal to 4.7 times 10 to the negative 11 moles per liter. And this makes a good point that if we start with carbonic acid, it's the first acid dissociation or acid ionization reaction that's really driving 
the concentrations in the solution. There's very, very little carbonate in the final solution. Notice 10 to the negative 11 moles per liter is much, much smaller than 10 to the negative 4 moles per liter for the bicarbonate and hydronium ion concentrations. So the vast majority of the components of this solution at equilibrium are derived from that first ionization, acid ionization reaction associated with Ka1. Just as acids can have more than one ionizable or removable proton, bases can contain more than one basic site and have the capacity to accept more than one proton. These are what we call polyprotic bases. Two examples of polyprotic bases are given in formula form on the slide, CO3 2 minus and PO4 3 minus, and both of these can accept more than one proton. An important clue that they have this capacity is the fact that they both have a charge that is more negative than negative one. So each of those charges, in a sense, can be neutralized by a single proton, making CO3 2 minus a diprotic base. We'll dig into that in a little more detail in a second. And PO4 3 minus a triprotic base. So to show you the structural origin for polyprotic bases, let's dig into carbonate anion a little bit. So here's carbonate, CO3 2 minus. This is a Lewis structure for carbonate. It's got two oxygen atoms with negative charge in this Lewis structure. And each of those can individually accept a proton, making this a diprotic base. It has the capacity to accept two protons. Notice that when it does accept two protons, the structure we end up at is carbonic acid, H2CO3. And as we saw previously, well, this is a diprotic acid. It's got two protons with the capability of being lost. Just as we looked at for the diprotic acid, carbonic acid, the diprotic base carbonate can engage in two reactions with water to produce hydroxide two different ways. Carbonate can accept a proton to create bicarbonate, HCO3 minus, and hydroxide, OH minus, and that's got a Kb1 value of 2 times 10 to the negative 4. Bicarbonate can accept another proton from water to produce carbonic acid, H2CO3, and OH minus. And here Kb2 is much, much smaller. So notice that just like for a diprotic acid, for a diprotic base, the second Kb, acceptance of the second proton tends to be much less favorable than acceptance of the first proton. And this has to do with the fact that the initial base has a charge of negative two and would love to get closer to neutral, a little bit closer to neutral by accepting a proton H plus. But the reactant in the second base ionization reaction has a charge of only negative one. And so it's got a little bit less of a driving force to accept a proton just to go from negative one charge to neutral. So Kb2 is much, much smaller than Kb1. And if there were a Kb3, that would generally be much, much smaller than Kb2. So polyprotic bases can be treated in much the same way as polyprotic acids as we've seen previously. We'll just be dealing with Kb and base ionization or base dissociation equilibria rather than acid ionization equilibria.